Well, we were going to do a quick introduction, but that was it. So this is us. That's our Facebook pages. Andrew's cold. And maybe just to add, so my role at Facebook is I'm a people scientist. I focus on recruiting analytics within the research team. And so the research team, it's characterized by what I call longer term analytics, which is more mature analytics, but not exclusively, because what it can also involve is detailed measurement processes. And so just wanted to, to start off with that introduction to, to my role. I love data, I love number crunching, but sometimes it gets a little bit too much. Hence you can see by my previous photo that uh, I like to get away from it all and the Arctic Circle is one of my favorite places because there's no uh, internet access there. So sometimes a, a break is needed. But I'm here today and I look forward to sharing some of the work that we've, we've done. So I'll pass it over to Brian. And I forgot to say that. Yeah, I used to be the director of Recruiting Insights. That's the um, dedicated recruiting team that partnered with Andrew's research team. And we've been doing the reporting and the insights and the business-oriented work of bringing the research and reporting and integration of all the other things to the recruiting team itself. Great. And that is another thing. If you work at Facebook, your vacations are usually quite exotic because you're all trying to get away from the internet. Uh, my, my former boss, she would go and um, snorkel at the bottom of the ocean if there was no internet there. Um, so as we get started, uh, what we were trying to do uh, in this research, we're here to give a presentation in front of parliament to talk about data privacy and UK laws. Oh, wait, um, no, no, we're not. We're, we're here for productivity analysis within the recruiting world and how we manage teams. Um, a bit of a background as we get started. At Facebook, we have a product management framework called Understand, Identify, and Execute. We have that framework relatively structured here on the page. We've made it more interesting and had some outcomes and next steps added to it, but we'll keep to that format for parts of this conversation. Within the understanding part is um, really understanding the issue and the problems. We start with the people problems. And as uh, Stacy like, alluded to, uh, the growth of Facebook has been quite tremendous. I'm going to give some numbers, but they are public. Uh, last night, Facebook reported earnings for Q1. Uh, and while it was up 8% on users and 30 plus percent on revenue and earnings, uh, the more important number was the headcount number, which is now 37,773, to be exact, at the end of Q1. Um, when I started, again, on April 6, 2015, the number was 6,100. That growth compounded annually is at over 50% over a year at scale, um, where we are interviewing um, over a million people. We were reaching out to over a million people in the recruiting organization and interviewing in the hundreds of thousands of individuals for the jobs. That infrastructure was expensive and huge. And about this time last year, we looked around the table after a relatively massive growth of the recruiting team, and we were exhausted. Because as we were trying to grow the company by 50% headcount a year, we were also having to hire our own recruiters and sourcers and coordinators at a very small time frame to get that all done within a couple months so they could actually deliver the headcount for the business in the next year. So we were exhausted. And it was about this time last year we decided we didn't know what the future held. We thought the growth was going to continue, and it obviously has. Um, but we were also hoping that we were going to get ahead of it. And that given we weren't super pleased with our current efficiency metrics and other business outcomes, we were like, we have, to, we have to get a handle on our operations and become more efficient. So the leadership team at that point just sat around and we realized that there was no silver bullet to it. Research is pretty vague when it comes to recruiter or source of productivity. There's no real good research that says you can do it without compromising quality, levels, skills, things that we weren't willing to give up. So from that basis, we were like, OK, what are the overall people problems for the organization that we're trying to solve? And then figure out the framework from there. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, from there, we moved over to the execute phase. Uh, the point with execution here that I want to draw your attention to, and Andrew will go into extreme details on this, because that's his part. He did all the work. I just created the framework for this argument, not the actual framework that he built, uh, was the clarity piece. The measurement clarity is imperative. A lot of the conversation over the last few days has been talking about the maturity curve, from, from descriptive analytics all the way to predictive analytics. And all that's fine, well, and good. Uh, the bigger issue for something as detailed as we were about ready to in, embark on is the extreme accuracy of the business outcomes. 
In your recruiting environment, that's quite easy and standardized. Hires, like offer accepts across the company, across the teams. It's a very discrete variable and one that's easily measured. But all of our systems measure hires. When we say extreme precision, we're referring to the integration, as I alluded to, between the systems. In another organization, I looked at the hires um, in the ATS, and about three or four percent of them were incorrect in the fact that they didn't show up on day one. So within Workday, the, uh, the other ERP system we were using in the back end, not at Facebook, another company, uh, they actually were hired and fired on the same day. So quick quits, as that manager used to say. And the problem with that is, even to two, three, or four percent delta within the outcome variables, particularly when we're doing it at an individual team member level, can throw the data pr tremendously. So that level of imprecision was not going to be acceptable. And that was one of the efforts that Andrew had to go in and do himself and clean up. So thank you, Andrew. Uh, right. And so from there, uh, we also want to talk about the long-term and resource intent investment here. This was a pretty extensive investment that took a, a long time. A, a year in Facebook world is, is forever. Uh, and the point of this, though, was a framework to build something that could be built and used over and over again as teams innovated themselves, as the several thousand person recruiting teams on individual pods would innovate and develop new ideas, we could then run this model against those ideas and see what's working and then sell it to the business. I'll hand it over to Andrew to talk about the execution phase. Oops, I forgot one thing. I rushed through that. Um, here are the people problems um, that, that we outlined. Um, and from there, these are the buckets, the framework that I uh, worked on, and with Andrew here in the middle, in the research section in the middle. Um, the two other things I did want to draw your attention to are the tools and processes. The tools piece, we had the luxury, if you want to call it that, of our own internal um, ATS team. So dozens of engineers were building our applicant tracking system and our CRM. The best part about that was that we got consensus that their tool had to drive two different dimensions. Recruiter velocity, candidate velocity, and candidate capacity per, re per recruiting individual. The theory here is that if you can get more people through the process faster per person, you are inevitably definitionally driving productivity. Again, the assumption there is that the pass-through rates stay relatively stable. But from a tools perspective, their objective was to drive those two metrics as they release new products. For the processes and internal ex um, aspects, there were some business things we were trying to get the business to switch to. More recruiter, more hiring from the university channels are much more efficient. So areas that were weak, we've been building up that team to hire more from there. And how do our cords improve their, uh, their hiring? So what we did was we grouped those people problems into those buckets. And from the research side, we focus on our structures of our teams and how and what aspects of those drive the performance. So with that, now I'm going to hand it over to Andrew for the execution phase. Great. Thanks, Brian. So focusing on the execute block, I'd like to break it down into three main phases. And the first phase is developing a measurement framework to measure performance. And so as Brian's mentioned, it's not performance in the traditional sense, 360 and the various guises that uh, appraisal systems can take. This is a business measure of performance, number of hires for talent acquisition. And recognizing it is a narrow definition, has limitations, but let's keep it positive. We've just met. So the positives are it's a quantitative measure. It is a narrow definition, very specific targeted, um, and it is also a core business measure, as I've mentioned, that the recruiting team is assessed on in terms of performance, but is also integral to the strategy that the team develops. And so I just want to take a, a quick step back. We're talking about productivity here as a performance measure. I would like you to look at this from the lens that this is adaptable, a replaceable concept. So in your organization, in your context, your productivity might be sales performance. It might be team performance in a, a different function. So the process should be similar, and hopefully you may see some things that, that you like to, to help measure performance in your context. So starting with the framework development, we had a metric review, looking at the current landscape, internally, externally, what's out there, how's it measured, and, and, and there we saw, as any process like this would 
would show is a lot of variation differences. So this is where we started to set out decision rules to define what we wanted. As we pivoted towards data and sorry, as we pivoted towards measurement, we looked at data integrity and we also carried out a compliance review before measurement. So that's namely GDPR considerations. And so what was the, the output? The output was a, a framework that had standardized characteristics and very deliberate standardization, but at the same time had adaptable components so that it could fit its use case. And there were multiple use cases. The one I'm talking about today is the first one in blue. It's around resource and process decision making for the audience of recruiting leadership. So quite high level strategic decision making. The second not in focus today is performance tracking, very granular for line managers. Um, that's the first stage, defining. But after that, the next is to measure. And measure is developing the infrastructure to be able to do this. It involves a SQL data extraction from our, our warehouse. Um, it involves uh, our studio, for those not familiar. It's open source software that uh, is programming based. It's well known for its data manipulation capabilities but also statistical analysis. Any data scientists in here are, are probably saying Python, Python. Uh, yes, we do use Python, but, statistic, but our studio we find in this for this research project has its advantages. Um, and what did we use it for? Created data frames. What does that mean? That's structuring the data in preparation for analysis. We created a productivity function. Those familiar with R know the function capabilities. It essentially means we created a program to carry out the definition of how we wish to measure productivity. Uh, we normalized the data. We looked for outliers um, as some examples, but of course there was quite a, a few processes there. And the final part of using R Studio was for data visualization. It's great in that it's customizable. So the disadvantage is you need to spend time programming to set it up versus a, a click and shoot kind of visualization software. But as mentioned, the, the real win is the visualization and the customization around that. And so the output was baseline performance by team taking a metric approach and performance over time. And we will see an example in a moment. So moving on to phase two, this is developing the foundations for the analysis. Um, and so the first step was, again, a brainstorm and a literature review what's out there. This, of course, took us to the traditional management research around spanner control, tenure, et cetera. And so they were included. But the output was a, a list, a, a long list, I think it's fair to say, of variables we could measure for productivity. Um, so we employed a prioritization system based on principles A, aligned to recruiting strategy, so the, the business, to use a generic term, B, aligned to decision making. What do I mean by that? Well, we looked at a variable. We asked ourselves if we know that there is a link between this variable and uh, performance, can we make a decision action? If not, deprioritize. The third is a consideration resource investment. Of course, if something's important, we will spend the time to measure it, uh, and I know that only too well, um, but it is part of the prioritization system. So we had a refined list of variables that we could therefore move to measure, and this is where we're getting into this rhythm again, developing the infrastructure further, developing the SQL, our studio, and the continuous checks. Um, that I've got down listed here. And so the output was that data frame, ready for analysis. That sounds quite a pedestrian task. Um, it really wasn't. It's, it, it is challenged to do it at this scale and the preciseness we, we wanted. Um, and so this prepares us for the analytics. We move to the basic analytics. And the, the first is to measure productivity and the descriptive stats uh, for each driver of productivity. Uh, again, we'll have an example in, in a moment. And so we, the, the output is we understand the impact of factors on productivity. So moving on to the third and final phase is this is where it moves to mature analytics. And so we have here on the, the left what we did, uh, quite a list of statistical tests that we, we did. I'm not going to linger on those for, for now. I've got some visuals to exemplify those. Um, but just to, to summarize what that does, it basically looks at all the potential drivers of productivity. It looks at the relationships between them. 
it starts to pick out the more important and reduce the number of factors. So we identify the, the most important factors and it understands the relationships between the factors and impact on productivity. Um, and so the outcomes were those deeper understandings that I've noted here. One I wanted to pick out is we had to look, watch out for nonlinear relations. What do I mean by that? Well, when we see that a, a driver has an impact on productivity and productivity goes up as that variable increases, we might find a point that actually productivity falls or plateaus. And so that's what we wanted to watch out for and those statisticians among us know that we have to adapt the test when we, we find that. Um, and that's also really important for the recommendations to understand where, what that relationship looked like. Um, and finally, it's to really understand the importance of the variables in terms of the impact, the effect of one variable on the other that can mask each other. So what we really, the purpose of this is to identify the most important variables. So the next stage, was developing recommendations from all this data and output we had, which we had a lot. And this is the fun part. This is where you start to story tell. And actually, I'm not in the business of this is interesting. I wish to drive action. That's where kind of my passion lies. And so this is what I look out for. Um, and this is where understanding the business is really important. Uh, and we have to do this very carefully and deliberate because A, this is a lot of new data to our recruiting leadership team. It's new, more advanced techniques. So we want to do this in a way that's effective. So we have a comms plan that uh, has these multiple considerations into play. Um, and finally, we collaborate with our cross-functional partners to, to drive change. And I'll, I'll um, take a, an example in a moment uh, for that one. Um, and so the output of the recommendation is we have a core set of recommendations across Facebook recruiting teams, and there are multiple. Um, that is where the trends are consistent across all teams. We also have team-specific recommendations, and we have team-specific automated PowerPoint analytical packs, uh, courtesy of, of our studio. Um, we also used our research to inform our operational performance dashboards, um, and we also, our long-term research informs our short-term uh, analytics capability. Um, and finally, research-driven product enhancements. That's where we worked with an example of working with a cross-functional partner, our engineering team, to help um, enhance tools based on our insights, because that can be a more effective way to make changes through tools. Okay. So now I just want to spend a moment to share some examples of those three phases. So I'm gonna move back to, to phase one. And so that's the, the basics of establishing a baseline performance measure. This is a really simple chart. X-axis is your monthly time frames. Uh, on the Y-axis is a productivity measure. So we can see month on month how each team has performed. Um, and we can do this by role, which you see recruiter and sourcer at the, the top. And so there's multiple teams at Facebook and this allows us to start establishing standardized baselines, which is very important. That gold line is the baseline in addition to descriptive statistics. And, and that's particularly important because as we moved into phase two, so from phase one, we established performance as an outcome. And as we move to phase two, we wanted to understand what influenced that outcome. So we started to put the drivers into this view. So going back to an example, spanner control being one, we would uh, include this in the visual. And spanner control, if we think of it as an attribute, having many facets. So you might have a team or a manager with a low spanner control two, maybe four, six, going up to larger spans of control 10. For each of those groupings dash spans, we would have a separate chart as you can see here. So each facets such as number of, uh, number of span will have a baseline. And this is really important as we progress into phase two, because this is what phase two is doing on this, again, quite a simple visual. What are we seeing here? Firstly, an attribute can be anything like span of control. What are the bubbles? The bubbles are the facets. So we might have a bubble for a span of control of two, four, six, et cetera. And so we can start to see when we isolate the individual attributes, 
where they lie on productivity. So at the bottom, you can see on the x-axis, we have lower productivity towards less, moving over to higher productivity. And in that center position, we have a dotted line. What's that? That's our baseline for our team performance, going back to the previous slide. So as we start to look at the facets and attributes, we understand what are the levers, what's pulling us above the line, what's pulling us below the line. That's phase two. We use this visual for phase three because that's where it started to get interesting. We use statistical significance to identify the, which factors are having a significant impact on productivity. In blue, in red is where they're having a negative impact. Uh, gray is insignificant dash inconclusive. Um, and, and this was a really important step because this complements the aggregated metric approach we saw because Regression modeling uses granular data, and so it addresses a lot of the limitations that is associated with aggregated data. Um, actually marrying the two is no easy task, um, and so this is where a lot of time spent for those familiar with regression, looking at RCO efficiency, um, et cetera, to make sure that the story and narrative uh, is the right one. So a lot of notes would uh, accompany this. Um, I just want to draw a small analogy because this data set might be unfamiliar, this context. So if we think employee engagement surveys, you may, for your team, get an engagement score of 86% versus last year, 80%. So that's a six percentage point difference. You may get a flag to say, this is statistically significant difference versus noise. This is exactly what uh, the uh, approach is doing here. Uh, so that's an example of role-based uh, drivers. We also... Um, categorize them into manager-based and team-based, and each of those categories has those attributes. And now moving on to after we've established what facets are driving productivity, we want to understand the dynamics between these facets. And this is where we use a technique called relative importance. And again, the purpose is to identify what's the most important factors to drive recommendations and move the needle. And this is, those familiar with regression, is very similar. It has, as you can see here, the aim is exactly the same. Understand the contribution each attribute makes towards explaining variance and productivity. What it does, arguably, is a more superior way of doing this when some of those drivers are fairly highly correlated with each other, which is why we use this technique. So what we would see here is it's almost a ranking system. Attribute A is by far having the biggest impact on productivity. And so spanner control would fall somewhere um, within this visual. So we've now established what are the um, attributes such as spanner control impacting productivity, the facets of such attributes such as the different spans, um, the next stage is to put this together. And, and this is basically looking at relative importance on the X. So as you go to the right, it becomes more important. Productivity on the Y, as you go higher, more productive. Uh, and you can see a baseline performance. So these are the most productive facets. And what we're doing here by taking this approach is we're trying to understand what's in the top right the most productive and the most important. And that's where we can start to drive our recommendations. The size of the bubble is the population size. So you can estimate how many of your current population have that attribute. And what's really nice is you can inverse that. So you can look at how many of that really productive attribute your population doesn't have. And so then that's an indicator for potential to, to drive um, and move that team to have more of that attribute. So I'm going to now pass it over to, to Brian. Right. <clears throat> Thanks. And Andrew was quite generous with the word we. I had very little to do with any of that. I nod and smile a lot. So, uh, so thank you for that statistical side. I'm not a stats person. Uh, but those core recommendations and reiterating another thing that Andrew said was we were able to go at a very granular level. So certain recruiting directors had their own data set. And not surprisingly, there were differences between a business recruiting team and a technical recruiting team. Um, there would be different team attributes or different groupings and sizes. So we were able to give that level of recommendations. At the end of the project, at the end of the first iteration of the first three iterations, however we want to call that, we had 10 core recommendations that we submitted, or Andrew submitted, um, to the leadership. 
Um, that was the ones that were consistent across each of the subgroups that, we pre that was presented to. We had individuals on those teams that were then tasked with staffing to help, as, as Andrew also alluded to, to actually operationalize this research and to make it actionable. We actually were able to hold back several heads um, for automatic approvals um, and we and not actually distribute those to the teams that requested them, simply because they were requesting them based on, well, I think we might need this because the demand might be there. That simple ability to have a couple more checks on that approval of recruiting headcount has saved the company between 10 to 20 million a year, depending how you count. Uh, and it has, more importantly, not had a reduction in our, or a negative impact in our ability to hire. It's also improved the other dimensions that we care about from a people analytics function in that it's improving ability of individuals to exceed their goals, to find internal opportunities, and to just generally not have to spend their days training another 20, 30% growth of the recruiting team. So there's been a ton of benefits um, just in the few months that we've had this research. With that, I'll hand it over to Andrew for the next steps. Great, thanks. And, and so when this first started out, it was a, a project. And it feels like it's relinquished its traditional definition and essence of a, a project and uh, more formed a program. Um, because we started out with one project, now we have uh, four projects um, on productivity. This is one that we've presented today, so one of, one of four. We have um, many more uh, researchers working on this, so I have uh, reinforcement. Um, and, and I think this is in part as a result of some of the um, outputs from this research and the actions that we, we've driven. And so it's a continued development of the program. And just to give a flavor of what that program will, will look like. So another one of the research pro uh, projects um, is job profiling work. Um, and that's a mixed methods uh, research methodology uh, that combines quantitative and qualitative data. So we're quite excited about going into the qualitative data to help inform us uh, around our productivity insights because that obviously unlocks new, po new potential. Um, and so there are some IO or organizational psychology techniques that we are using for that mixed methods research. Um, and as part of this program, as we continue with the research, something that we also do uh, on a continuous basis is evaluation. So that's evaluation to inform the impact of our research and future success. So what do I mean by that? Well, we revisit the, our initial analysis and we understand based on current data what changes have happened since we've made those recommendations and uh, that are specifically action oriented And so we start to understand where the needle is moving, and if it's not moving where we expected, again, we revisit the data. So it's about informing future success, because I think sometimes evaluation is more around kind of current success, but what we're trying to move very much towards is using it for establishing future success and, and continuous learning. Um, and, and so this project represents, and, and going back to the original notion of a long-term research project, this, as you can see, requires a lot of resources uh, to be invested in it, uh, and there is a lot of advantages, um, but can only do so if teams are built with the capability to do so. So within my current research team, uh, we focus on the long-term research because we have that opportunity. There are teams that uh, focus on shorter term insights. That's the kind of the fire drills in the business, the reporting, the dashboards, etc. But that almost protects us uh, and our time uh, to concentrate on, on research. And so while data maturity, I use that terminology a lot for, for stakeholders to identify what we do and we uh, align to more mature analytics. So I think it's very important that we also um, we also mentioned that it's around long-term analytics that aren't just around mature analytics. It's around getting precise measurement. Um, that sometimes is quite hard work and takes a lot of resources, but once you do it well, um, it can be quite fruitful. With that, any questions? I think Stacy has some questions. <laughs> Okay, I'll lead off with the first question and then turn it over to you all. 
Um, you all used a lot of pretty sophisticated uh, approaches. You know, I think a lot of executives are familiar with regression, but you used RWA and some other approaches in there. Um, did you get any pushback from them on what are you doing, how does this work, or were you able to kind of explain it in a simple way so that you were able to focus them on the results? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So um, we tried to keep it simple, as you can say. So we didn't go in heavy detail on the statistical analyses. And what we tried to do is actually where we use statistical analyses that leadership were already familiar with, um, and actually that falls mostly within the, the realms of uh, engagement surveys that use significance, going back to the example, they're fairly familiar and au fait with the significance concept and, and regression. Um, and, and so um, we were using that to, to leverage, based that understanding to, to leverage um, and represent what we did. Um, so that's probably the main point. And so we certainly wouldn't go into to heavy detail uh, where we felt the, the audience didn't, didn't know that. Um, I, and I should also reflect that we do have training courses for our leadership team on kind of basic stats, so they do have a, a good level. So that may be a consideration um, for, for other organizations. Um, but I think the... I think the, the ethos that we try to adopt is less is more. Right. And, and if you look at that, the models with the, the blue and the red, that's, that's the level of detail. Like Andrew did go into some more, de more of the stats behind it, but by saying look at the blues and look at the reds, half the stuff we were doing is myth busting. And like, oh, we think that's true? No, actually it's the opposite. Or no, that's not statistically different. And so half of the research was just easily consumed by those charts without the details. I mean, Andrew said it, but I don't know if they listened, <laughs> honestly. I have questions. Um, would you be able to give more examples of attributes that you use to measure productivity? For example, recruiters that uh, were focusing on tech profiles versus recruiters that were focusing on more sales uh, types of profiles? Because so you mentioned that they differed. Yeah, so we broke up the teams. We, just, we knew that was a, a dimension already, so we didn't even bother. Well, we looked at it as an aggregate, but we never set that as an attribute between sales or business or tech, since there's just an inherently different productivity um, dimension between that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to go into more of the specifics? And, and just to, to confirm, so we, we would present the results by, by team, so recruiting team, because recruit, some teams would hire for roles with high... Um, what we would call high difficulty. So that would be where there's sometimes just a handful of folks with those uh, knowledge, skills, and attributes around in the world. And so their productivity will be lower. So that's where we normalize the results by, by team, but we didn't consider it as a driver of productivity per se. It was more of the span of control, tenure, uh, et cetera. Um, if I understand correct, you had a control group and a test group. And then you draw your insights from there. But uh, did you do any cross validation or something to be sure that the model uh, was performing, uh, would perform the same in different types of, in different data sets? Or? Yes, we, we, we did. Um, we did it um, for across uh, the organization. Um, and then the, the way Facebook is organized, like many organizations, is it has different organizational levels, and you start up with quite a high grouping and go to more, to, to more lower levels. So we basically went as low as we, we could in terms of granularity, um, where sample size permits, and that's where it starts to creep and the statistics and start to come a little bit cumbersome. So we did validate in specific populations as well. Did you find differences uh, can, um, um, country from can, uh, yeah, between countries? Sorry, um, I, I guess you normalize normalize it maybe. I don't know. Yeah, we, we looked at that it, again. It was the principles of looking at higher levels. So we would look at region first because you have the the bigger sample sizes that that are generally better for the statistics. And where uh, where we could, we went to the more granular country level. But some of our countries have very small teams, and so it's just not gonna not gonna work. There is differences, but usually it got buried within like the majority of what you're focused on. 